Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. That's right. U.S. Representative of Minnesota and 2024 presidential candidate Dean, Dean Phillips. Phillips. Welcome. In unison. <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. How, How are, are you? you? I'm. You know what? I'm. Uh, I'm humbled. I'm really humbled to be with you guys. Happy I'm doing great. Happy to be in Manhattan. Happy to be on this journey, and happy to be with you guys. So let's let's start with why. Why jumping into this crazy race? Well, because I'll be alive to see the fruits of our labor. That's one reason. Mm-hmm. I think it's time for change. I'm sick of a country that makes all these promises doesn't fulfill any. And uh, when I went to Congress in 2019, I was just disgusted. Now I understand what's so damn wrong in our country mm-hmm. and why this system defeats everybody here. Mm. Uh, and I want to do something about it. I lost my dad in Vietnam. He gave his life to the country. The least I can do is pay something back. And the way to do it is to try to change stuff. And I'm, I'm really frustrated and I'm disappointed. And the lack of courage in Washington and Congress and this country right now, I think it's time for our generations to rise and, and stop this nonsense and actually realize what we can be and reclaim um, some of the principles and values I think we all share. And I'm really pissed off, to be honest with you. I'm so what, really is, pissed what, off. what is wrong with our country? Well, I think our country was founded on the premise that all are created equal and we've never fulfilled it. Mm -hmm. And that's just true in so many cases. And, you know, we, Washington is such a culture of rewards for the wealthy and the well-connected. And it's this little capsule, it's this little like uh, balloon, if you will, uh, that is so disconnected from reality. And we have a system that breeds and rewards sticking around there and, and staying there. Mm-hmm. And nobody gets out and listens. And I gotta, I've only been doing this two months. You know, look, at I come from Minnesota. I'm a white congressman from a suburban <laughs> Minneapolis district. I thought I knew shit. I thought I, I thought I knew people. I thought I knew what was wrong. But boy, until I've been traveling the country and going to little towns and uh, through the east and the west, north and south, I got to tell you, it's really uh, opened my heart and mind. And uh, we're broken. Mm-hmm. And we can either complain about it and argue about it and yell about it and hate each other for it, or we can do something about it. I still think we can do something about it. So and I that, just want to be that voice. It's a lonely voice some days, but uh, that's what I want to do. Always ask, so, so what do you think about the job that, that Biden has done so far? And, and, and jumping on what Charlemagne said, what do you think he could have done better? Mm-hmm. Well, look, you know, I, 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 wanna, I, I respect our president, and I'm so glad he won in 2020 because he saved us. Uh, he can't do it again. He's not electable. But to answer your question directly, which I know is rare for politicians, you know, I think it's a lot of promises, you know, a lot of promises. A lot of people promise to do this and that, and then they get into office, and then they, you know, they love the seats, and mm-hmm. they love the chairs, and they love the thrones, if you will, and don't do a whole lot. Um, I think he's a good man. I think he served our country well. But when you've been there for 50 years, you've never had life experience outside of Washington, D.C. That's real. It changes you, man. You know, it just does. Mm -hmm. You know, I come at it from a different angle. I I don't want to condemn him and demean him, but I think he's let a lot of people down. And I want to do something differently. And I think it's time to stop rewarding the wealthy and the well-connected and actually bring people to the table who are not just deserving, but have great ideas and can change this nonsense because, you know, we've got a lot. We, we spend a trillion dollars a year, you know that? A trillion dollars a year defending, defending ourselves, right? But look, we got people sleeping in the streets, kids going to school hungry, you know, r- racial wealth gaps that are just disgusting. We have uh, education gaps. We have housing gaps. We, food and fuel are too expensive. And we're spending all this money around the world trying to keep us safe. Now, two we got people sleeping in the streets. So, you know what? Two bucks we got money for war, we can't feed the poor. Bingo. Yeah. And, and I'm sick of it. And look at, I, you know, we're my dad's dog tag here, you know. Um, he died in a helicopter crash in Vietnam in 1969, three days after we landed on the moon. Wow. You know? and, and by the way, his helicopter was a total mosaic of America. A couple of black guys, a couple of Jewish guys, a couple of Italian guys, a Mexican-American guy who wanted to be an American so bad, he joined the U.S. Army and had been naturalized as a U.S. citizen just weeks before he was killed. Wow. And, you know, I, I think about all those soldiers then, you know, looking up at the moon and saying, my goodness, this is like America at its very, very best and looking down at their boots and seeing us at our very, very worst, you know, and we're still that country. You know, we can still go to the moon or we can still mm-hmm. be the country that's looking down at our boots. And I'm just um, I want to do the former, you know, that's crazy. And I just think the moonshot shouldn't be going to outer space. Let's take care of stuff right here. I was going to say, that's crazy. My dad actually flew helicopters and, really? f- and fixed helicopters in Vietnam. No kidding. Absolutely. Why? Is he still living? Still alive. Uh, I'd still love, alive. seriously, I, if I could just tell a little quick story. When I came home, I went to the crash site, actually, I think I just told you guys, and went to the place where you know he, he was killed, and 
I'd, for 30 years, I was trying to find the one guy who was still alive from that crash. He was the co-pilot, a guy named Tom Devereaux. And I sent emails, I made phone calls, could never find him. And I just suspected, you know, suspected that he didn't want to connect because it's probably hard. Mm -hmm. And I came home, the Today Show did a little story about my trip to Vietnam. And um, through a strange twist of fate, I emailed that email address I had. I got a response this time. And it was Tom Devereaux's wife saying, we want you to come to his 80th birthday in Colorado. Wow. And I got to, I traveled there and gave Tom a hug, the one survivor from that wow. helicopter crash. And he didn't want me to come for years because he didn't think I would want to be with him. And I told him that my dad would have wanted me to give him a hug. And that's kind of, when you ask me what I want to do, that's what I want to do. You know, did have it's time any, to hug it out. Did you have any conversations about like your father's last moments or? You know, he said that, um, well, first of all, you know, he was, uh, he felt terrible. You know, he told me about the crash and said that he didn't know the guys in the back of the helicopter well because his job was to fly and their job was to you know, do other stuff. And he didn't have a lot of memories, but that's mm -hmm. not what mattered. You know, he was, he's the only living mm -hmm. person that was with my dad when my dad died. And it's kind of a, it was a powerful moment, you know? Wow. Yeah. Question, uh, mm -hmm. was there like an unwritten agreement in Washington that Biden was supposed to only run for one term? <laughs> Such an example of Washington. You know, nobody ever says it straight, mm -hmm. you know, imply and kind of nuance. And yeah, look, we all knew that he was going to serve one term. You know, he, he said it essentially mm -hmm. implied, if not explicit. And look at people can change their minds. And he did. I think he's doing himself and the country a huge uh, disservice. Um, but I can't say he told us specifically, I will serve one term. Don't tell mm -hmm. anybody. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what we all expected. And that's what I'm disappointed because Democrats we're disappointed that he was running again. Mm -hmm. But God forbid you actually get in front of the cameras and say it. You know, I torpedoed my career for doing just that, and so be it. Someone's got to say it. I wanted to ask you that. Are you worried about the future of your political career after this? Oh. Or do you have a future in politics after this? Not after becoming president. You know, mm -hmm. seriously. I look, mm -hmm. you know, well, I, look at, I, well, we can talk a lot of stories, but I woke up the morning after the 2016 election. I had a really nice life. You know, we had built Belvedere Vodka and sold it and built Talenti Gelato, the ice cream brand, and sold it. Oh, you, you, I had, you, you were the, one of the owners of Belvedere Vodka? Yeah. I got a great story to tell you on that one wow. if you want to hear one. With Jay Z, your name and all that? Break it down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, okay, I'll, I'll tell the Belvedere story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is actually a good one. So in 1993, uh, my father and I and our business partner go to Poland because we think we can sell schnapps <laughs> to the Poles. You said your father and you? My father. My, I'm, oh, my, so my dad died in Vietnam. I was six months, I'll tell you a quick story. My, yep, yep, yep. I was, my dad was um, 26 when he was killed. I was six months old. My mom was 24 and widowed. By the way, my dad grew up poor in Minnesota. Dad, his dad died, my grandpa, when he was a kid. He couldn't afford college. He earned an ROTC scholarship, and that's why he went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So my mom was 24 and widowed. We have nowhere, nowhere to live, and uh, we had to stay with my great-grandparents for three years. And then I got lucky. You know, I got lucky. My, my mom remarried and when I was three years old. Adopted by a father named Eddie Phillips, brought me into an amazing family of mm -hmm. success and philanthropy. My grandma was Dear Abby, and my aunt what? was Ann really? Landers. Yeah, yeah. Abby, you really? want some advice? You got some love learning <laughs> issues, wow. you guys? Let me help you out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I got lucky and uh, ended up uh, joining the family business um, out of college, and we wanted to expand. So we went to Poland to try to sell some of our stuff. We made schnapps, of all things. But we get to Poland and we see the most beautiful bottle we'd ever seen. It was Chopin vodka at the duty free store. And then we also discovered Belvedere and we changed our whole trip to ask the Polish government if we could be the importers of this beautiful vodka. My dad on the back of a napkin looked at Absolute and Stoli, the most you know, beautiful brands of the time, $15 a bottle. Mm -hmm. And he thought, you know, we can actually take it up a notch. You know, he liked the idea of when there's two big brands fighting each other, there's mm -hmm. a way to go above them. So we did it. And the brand was introduced, and it didn't do that well at first. It was $25. It was very expensive. We didn't have a lot of access to the market. But I'm getting ready one morning. It must have been 1997, a few years, a couple of years in. And I'm, I've got MTV on, and I see a, vi a Jay-Z video where he's got Belvedere. He's pouring it. Big Pimpin', right? That was Big Pimpin'? I don't remember. I don't remember. I think it, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Pouring them on people. You open the fridge. It's filled with Belvedere. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I literally, I dropped my razor and I called my, this is, you know, analog era. I called my father. I'm like, dad, turn on MTV. Of course, he doesn't know what channel it was. So, and I don't worry. They're going to play it 10 times again today. We, the, our whole business at that time, we had 20 people. We sat around the TV in our office waiting for that video to come back mm -hmm. on. And I'm telling you, it was a moment I'll never forget. 
the video comes on and we are just, our jaws hit the floor because we knew everything was going to change. And sure enough, within a couple weeks, you guys, I mean, the orders started just pouring, pouring in. Wow. So what happens? Jay-Z contacts my father and they have dinner in Manhattan. And the way it was described both by Jay Brown and my dad, Eddie Phillips, is it was a beautiful dinner. Mm -hmm. And Jay-Z, as he often does, was soliciting advice and business counsel. And you might know Jay-Z in introduced a vodka brand. Do you know that? Called Armadale. 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 Remember yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Didn't do that well. But that was a result, I think, of that experience. Jay-Z built Belvedere Vodka. And I think that was the first time maybe this whole country recognized that power of influencers back what? in an analog era. I remember. Why didn't y'all give like why didn't y'all just give them equity into the company? He didn't ask for it. Really? Wow. Wow. I don't I don't think Jay I think Jay Z had his I own mean, ideas. The, yeah, yeah, at the time I'm sure yeah. he had his own yeah. ideas. But, I, but, but I'm glad you say that actually, Charlemagne, because mm -hmm. Our family culture, my, my grandfather used to tell me all the time, he said, Dean, money is like manure. Mm -hmm. if you stack it up, it stinks. But if you spread it out, it fertilizes. Mm -hmm. So that was his whole culture and business. Mm -hmm. um, he established the first profit sharing program in America in the 1940s. We had secretaries retiring with seven figure you know, retirement accounts. When we sold Belvedere, we shared it with our employees. When we sold Talenti, we shared with em employees because that's kind of the, the joy of business mm -hmm. is to share. So I don't have an answer for you why we didn't share equity with him, but um, did y'all did y'all reach out to any other artists or even try to have a more long term partnership mm -hmm. with them? Or you know, we we, we talked about that at the time mm -hmm. and felt that the brand was predicated on authenticity. Mm -hmm. So rather than paying people to position it and market it, and you know, we just thought it was better to have an authentic brand. Uh, so I, I'm not going to say we've done that on every brand, but on Belvedere, it was about authenticity. So we let people adopt it, discover it themselves. And it uh, worked pretty well. Why but, do you think uh, when it came to like Jay launching Armadale, it didn't have the same impact as Belvedere? Like him promoting Belvedere caused Belvedere's, you know, stock to shoot up. But why didn't it work for Armadale? It's a good question. Well, here, I'll tell you the other story about Belvedere. So this is the analog era. We did not have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But we had this belief that if we could find 200 people in the U.S. to be the early adopters, kind of the ambassadors, that we might just stand a chance. And we created a special box, uh, sent it to 200 people, uh, you know, actors like you know, Robert De Niro, I think Jay-Z got one, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, political leaders, business leaders, fashion leaders, all this stuff. And then we did an ad, and the, they call the top right corner of page three of the Wall Street Journal the Tiffany section, the Tiffany spot, because Tiffany had owned it for years, mm -hmm. because it's the, when you open a newspaper, especially in the old days, your eyes always went to the top corner. Very expensive. We did an ad, that had the picture of the distiller of Belvedere in Poland. His name was Bogdan Zelensky. And there's a photo of him, and it just said, Bogdan, Belvedere, Bogdan wants to know how you like it. There was no picture of the bottle. It didn't say vodka. But the 200 people that got that box, they were the only 200 people that knew what that ad meant. And there's a little note in the box saying, uh, watch the newspaper that day. So what happens? Um, Robert De Niro is at the, I think, the Peninsula Hotel in, in Beverly Hills, mm -hmm. and he orders a Belvedere martini from the bartender. Bartender says, sorry, sir, we only have Absolute and Stoli. He says, I don't think that you understand. I want a Belvedere martini. So the bartender sends like the bar back down the street to a bottle shop, finds a bottle of Belvedere, brings it back. The whole bar is watching this whole scene unfold, apparently. And De Niro gets his Belvedere martini. Within weeks there, the brand starts exploding. Wow. So what we did isn't really pay anybody, but we made people feel special, that they were unique. You know, they mm -hmm. were one of just a handful which is, you know, that's the human condition. You know, we want to be heard. We want to be mm -hmm. influential. We called it information one upsmanship. When you discover something, a great song, a good artist, a, a great show, a movie, whatever mm -hmm. it is, you like telling people about it, right? Because you want to be an influencer. I mean, look at you guys. So that's kind of the nature of what we did with that brand. Yeah, I just always wonder how do uh, these brands choose to pay people yeah. who help their brand back you know yeah. I, I would think it would be to give them some equity but if not like what do you just say thank you cinema well, <laughs> yeah i mean well first of all sharing equity is mm -hmm. well uh there's some other people that have um, i mean the shrock story is a is a talk about a great Let's success right well, mm -hmm. well well let me go let me just well, first of all go i don't back. think let it was me, big you, i don't i want to i don't because you know our hip-hop purists over there i don't think it was big pimping i think big pimping was champagne so i'll I find don't, i don't remember. Yeah, you, <laughs> i have somebody yeah, find yeah. out what it was but yeah. go ahead well, it's, well, but let me talk about you asked about why armandale didn't do well i think people sniff bullshit pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Armadale was a conceived brand from Scotland. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't really, you know, it, it was a little bit of an odd notion. 
And I think that was the difference. For Jay-Z, Belvedere was legit. He discovered it. He positioned it. It was authentic. Yeah, you could tell. Yeah, yeah. When, a, when an artist just intention, I mean, now like everybody's got a tequila. Do you guys have a tequila yet? No. Okay. You know what I mean, though? But you know what I'm talking about. Everybody's yeah, yeah. got a tequila right now. Mm-hmm. After the first one, it's kind of, you know, everybody's doing it, right? right? So I think that's why it didn't work. It's got, you know, it's still got to be real. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if you're the biggest name in the world, you know? If people sniff through it that it's not real, that's you know, kind of authenticity rules, you know? If they would have asked, and this is my last question, you know, if Jay-Z or Robert De Niro would have said, hey, I, I'll keep promoting it, but I need some equity. Oh, I think, I think if, I, first of all, I can't, I wasn't at the dinner. I don't know if Jay-Z asked my dad, but if I had been running the company at that moment and Jay-Z asked for a stake in the brand, darn right. Wow. Darn right. Because when you own, oh, by the way, what a great segue. Do you talk about running for president? Mm-hmm. Ownership. When you have a stake in something, a home, you know, a neighborhood, a, a business, right? Anything, you know, you 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 promote it, you you protect it, you know, you nurture it, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the that's the beautiful thing about ownership. My whole my whole premise for running for president is until we spread out. Remember, I talked about money like manure. Until yeah. you spread it out, until you give people a chance to own a little something, you don't have to own the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But the difference, you know, when you when you have a stake in a business, you know, you turn off the lights at night and you you, you reuse paper clips and you don't throw away the pens because every penny matters. You know, mm-hmm. that's the story. Everybody needs a little ownership in something. And well, if you don't own something, you act in. Look, I'm going to get down to it. You know, you, I think about Gaza right now and I think about my life in Minneapolis and and George Floyd that notion of you know when people don't have anything to protect when they're just trying to defend themselves why would we expect people to act any differently why do we always mistake quiet for peace Mm. you know what I mean that's kind Mm. of that to me that there's a link there to ownership you know Mm. if you don't own something you're not going to treat anybody or anything with respect and I think we should start waking up to that what got you into politics? Because obviously yeah. you're a, a, a great business person. You talk about the gelato. You talk about the liquor, Penny's Coffee. So <laughs> it's either that, you know, something made you say, I, yeah. I need this change, or you got bored. It's like, what got you into politics? I'll tell you, well, first of all, if nothing else, you can't say I don't know what Americans like. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> coffee, <laughs> coffee, vodka, and ice cream. You got taste. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll tell you. Uh, I was living a nice life, and um, I was really lucky, and I was watching the 2016 election um, with my family and I was just I was blown away by what happened that night you guys and I just I, I just didn't conceive that that man could win mm-hmm. you know I just didn't and that's why this is so consequential now we know what we're at, what we're risking anyway I watched that election that night my family literally was just shocked and I'm the kind of guy I'm an optimist you know I'm just wired that way and I told my family like you know give him a chance you know like he's the newly elected president you know the White House is going to moderate him and you know mm-hmm. keep him in check of course I was wrong but I'll tell you I woke up the next morning and um, the first thing I heard was my daughter who was 16 crying in her bedroom and she had just recovered from cancer she had Hodgkin's lymphoma as a young teen and she's a gay woman and I didn't know that at the time but she was in tears and I looked in her eyes and I saw as her dad, something I'd never seen before, like a fear of being an American in the future. And I know a lot of kids wake up that way every day in this country, but it really affected me. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I had a moment. I sat at the breakfast table with my two daughters, uh, one at college through FaceTime, and I promised them I would do something. Mm-hmm. You know, I had to do something. I just couldn't watch this. And I decided I'd run for Congress. I talked to some friends and people who I respect. They all said I was crazy, out of my mind. I torpedo my career. I'm going to lose. So I did it. And um, what they didn't, the reason they thought I'd lose is I was running in a district, this suburban district in Minneapolis that had not elected a Democrat since 1958. Mm -hmm. And that's how deep red it was. And the guy that won in 2016, the Republican, he won by 14 points. So people thought I was nuts. And I had to do it. And I did. And we won. Beat the guy by 12 points. Wow. And we did it with the most simple strategy you can imagine. Invitation instead of confrontation. And the biggest issue with politics is that People who grew up in politics think that by demeaning and diminishing and ignoring uh, and yelling at 50% of the country that you can succeed. And when I'm in business, I, I don't know how you can succeed if you call your customers idiots or deplorables or jerks or morons, you know, and that's how politicians operate. So I invited people. I didn't care their politics. I care mm-hmm. about their principles. And we won. And that's why I did it. And I think... You know, it was a moment. We all have those mm-hmm. moments, you know. You either stand up or you shush up and sit down. My party wants me to shush up and sit down. Mm-hmm. But it's funny because my party at that day in 2016, the day after the election, my party, wa- my party wanted me to stand the heck up. 
And now they're telling me to sit down. You, you know That's what I, the problem. I find interesting, uh, I, Joe Biden said, he said himself that he thinks that at least 50 other Democrats could beat Trump. So, so with that said, why don't more people primary him? Like, why, <laughs> why didn't people take that as an invitation? I'll tell you, Charlemagne, because <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to go through what I'm going through right now, which is the most vicious, um, atrocious, aggressive attacks you can possibly imagine. Behind and now I understand. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, I mean, it's aggressive. I mean, two months ago, I was a darling in the Democratic Party, and now I'm the devil. And I knew that. And by the way, I knew that. I, mm-hmm. I, I knew what I was getting into. But you ask the question, why don't others do it? Mm-hmm. Well, most people don't want to be subject to it. Most people want to protect their image and their future and their, you know, their career. And that's why you have all these sheep in Washington falling in line constantly, saying the same thing based on the talking points because they don't want to do anything to hurt the next chance to be reelected. So when I did this, I knew my career in Congress was done, and it is. And when I called other candidates whose names are much better known than me, they all said, basically they said no, because they knew what they would be subject to. And I just wish more people had the courage to stand up right now, and um, I'm disappointed. So why don't they... um like when I, when I think about stuff like that, why don't they go after the Joe Manchins and the Kristen Cinemas the way you're doing? Meaning like when Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema mm-hmm. was blocking progress yeah. and blocking his agenda, are they threatening them like that behind the scenes? I doesn't sure doesn't seem like it. Yeah. By the way, all I'm doing is practicing democracy, you guys. I mean, you know, this country was founded on the notion that we would not have coronations, you know, that we would have elections, that we would practice democracy. Mm-hmm. And damn, sometimes we do it okay, most of the time we don't, but it's really concerning that we have two parties right now. By the way, George Washington, of all people, warned us against factions. He mm-hmm. warned us 200 and some years ago that this experiment would fail if we allowed factions, political parties, to take over, and they have. And that's part of the system because, you know, when you are when something's at risk, you need to make your case... Uh, this is what Trump did to everybody in the Republican Party, right? You know, if you so much as whispered something bad about him, he would crush you, which is yes. why the right he would crush yes. you. Well, what do you think, Democrat? You don't think Democrats operate the same way? Just now, behind the scenes, behind the scenes, trying to crush. And that's, by the way, I would love if they did it up front. Like if they, yeah. if, if the way Trump calls out people in his uh, party, if Biden did that to Manchin and Cinema, at least we see them fighting. Yeah, that's well, all I want. I have you ever seen fighting. Biden fight? You know, first of all, I mean, he's a good man. He's 81 years old, but you know, he's not here today. He's not. He doesn't. He won't even take my calls. I called him twice just to be. I think it's the right thing to do when you when you challenge somebody or you're going to say something about somebody. You know, you, you, be a man. Call him right. And I did, and he doesn't even want to take my calls. I don't. Wow. I wish. I wish he would stand up in front of the microphones and express himself. Mm-hmm. I wish he would. I wish he would debate me. I mean, how the heck in this country in the 21st century? Can you go through a campaign and not debate, not show up, not ask, answer questions? You know, I mean, come on, guys. What, what's going on? You know, Biden, he says that uh, Trump is the end of democracy as we know it, which I agree with. Mm-hmm. But isn't him skipping out on debates a lack of democracy, too? Thanks for saying it. Thanks for just saying the quiet part out loud. Seriously, mm-hmm. Charlemagne, man, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. How can Democrats say we're fighting for democracy, we're fighting to make voting easier, and then yet removing me from the ballot in Florida and uh, North Carolina? Uh, how can you say you are for free speech and protecting freedom and democracy and not even consent to doing one debate? Mm. You know, how can you say this? How can you say to, right now they're saying this to voters in New Hampshire, um, that their vote doesn't count, that this is a meaningless primary. And it's true, by the way, Democratic voters in Florida, North Carolina, and New Hampshire their votes don't count because in two states there isn't going to be a Democratic primary. In the other state, uh, there is, and their votes aren't going to matter. And this wow. is the United States of America. So, look, I was in the House chamber on January 6th. I know what an insurrection is like. I know who inspired it and who promoted it. And now, frankly, Democrats are doing something to democracy that I think is just as dangerous as the insurrection. Because at the end of the day, one was to prevent the counting of ballots. And right now, the Democratic Party is literally trying to prevent names from being added to ballots and people from even voting on those ballots. So that's the truth, and they don't want to hear it. They don't want me to say it, but guys, man, someone's got to listen. This isn't new, though. I mean, they kind of did the same thing to Bernie uh, in 2016, right? (laughs) In fact, I had to apologize to Bernie. I've had, I have, I tell you guys, in the last five years, um, it's living a whole lifetime. Uh, I used to think Bernie Sanders was a sore loser, uh, inconsequential, and now that I'm going through the same thing, this is maybe 
I wish everybody would go through life like this. You know, I'm going through the same thing, and now I discovered yeah. he was right. And wow. I did a tweet. I apologized to him because Marianne Williamson, by the way, I want to talk about her. She's a real person of courage, you know. Oh, no, I got we got love for Marianne. She comes up here. She's been up here quite a, quite I love a bit. It. Man. She, you know, she doesn't. First of all, MSNBC has not as extended a single invitation to me in the last two months, despite being a sitting member of Congress, a member of a former member of House leadership, and, and the like. You know, we can't find platform. And I want to salute her courage too. She's in the race. She's showing up. Right. Mm -hmm. We had a debate the other day. We're having one tomorrow on News Nation. Um, I just wish more people would show up and speak the truth. We have a lot of people working to keep us from the truth, and I'm really sick of it. And if my mission in life is to say the quiet part out loud, nah, so be it. Now, I got, I got a question. So why why a Democrat over a Republican, right? Because most, mm -hmm. I don't want to say most people, but a lot of people in your position who yeah. has a net worth of- Rich white men hundreds of millions of dollars. Say. Is that what he's trying to say? Just yeah. come on, be, yeah, rich just, white just, men. just say it. Hundreds of millions of dollars again. <laughs> you know, your slogan is make America affordable again. People look at you and say, well, why not Republican, right? Mm -hmm. Because usually Democrats have high taxes and, yeah. and, and attack people like yourself that make hundreds of millions of dollars because they want more money for the people yeah. to afford and that will be cutting into a lot of the, the profits that you make and you are such a, uh, a successful business person with all the companies that we name. So why Democrat? So look, I've never walked in your shoes and you guys not in mine, but the place mm -hmm. I come from, uh, Minneapolis, has a really um, dark history and it really informs who I am and, and what I believe. And, and in the 1940s, uh, Minneapolis was one of the most anti-Semitic and racist cities in America. You wouldn't have known it. Um, and it took a young mayor named Hubert Humphrey, who was in his 20s, to call attention to it and set up a civil rights commission. Back in the 1940s Minneapolis, hospitals would not allow Jewish physicians to practice on their um, staff. They wouldn't allow black physicians. If you were black, Jewish, or Greek, you had to prepay your hospital bill in Minneapolis. This is in post-war Minneapolis. And my family became very deeply engaged in trying to correct these wrongs. Um, the, the black community in Minneapolis right now, for the most part, lives in North Minneapolis. That's where the Jewish community had to live. Why? Because of redlining. Mm -hmm. It was a very kind of a shared history. Mm -hmm. And so wh why I'm a Democrat? Because I saw firsthand and I come from a place in which there was such extraordinary injustice and a Democrat is the one against all odds, a white man named Hubert Humphrey is the first one to do something about it. And have you guys heard his speech at the 1948? Mm -mm. Please, everybody yeah. listening. Herbert Humphrey? Hubert, Hubert, Hubert Humphrey. H. Humphrey, mm -hmm. 1948 Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. This is when Strom Thurmond and all those racist Democrats from the Dixie South, Kratz. Dixiecrats, showed up to the convention. This young mayor from Minneapolis gets up on the stage knowing that he might torpedo his career. And he says to the Democrats gathered there, it's time for Democrats to get out of the shadows of states' rights and into the bright sunshine of human rights. And I think it's hard to not recognize that that was the moment that actually started giving permission to Democrats to move into the civil rights era. And it's not well known. There's, I don't think there's video of it. That may be why people don't know about it. But I think it was the most, one of the most important speeches of the modern era because half of that audience walked out of the arena that day. And... I come from that place, and that's why I'm so proud to be a Democrat. Hubert Humphrey also said, the mm -hmm. moral test of a government is how it treats those in the dawn of life, the dusk of life, and the shadows of life. And I just think it's our responsibility, especially those of us who have been really lucky and fortunate and have had the blessings of, uh, of this country, um, have to do something to make it the same for others. Why should I be in this position just because I got lucky? You know, Why, if you're just born in a certain zip code, does that dictate where your zip code when you end your life will be. You know, it's just, that's not right. And I'm just sorry about the Democratic Party making all these promises and talking up a game that they never seem to really fulfill and never get to it when we have the chance. And we always back away from the bold uh, notions that we talk about. And I don't know, I just feel I have a calling right now to uh, reimagine, reinvent, relieve, and uh, re-inspire mm -hmm. people. Um, and that's why I'm a Democrat. It's not about protecting my money. It's about sharing more with people so they can have the same damn chance I had. That's what it's about. I know, I know you always talk about wanting to repair our broken government. Can you really repair this government if we don't get rid of the filibuster? Probably not. Well, yeah. first of all, here, look, we have two issues. One is the executive branch. I'm running to be an, ex I'm a much better executive than I am a legislator. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the answer to the question about the executive branch, darn right, we can reimagine that. You know, when I'm president, we'll have a bipartisan cabinet it's not going to be just a bunch of politicians. I want the best and brightest. I want I want new positions. I want to fill that White House with extraordinary thinkers. You know, 
I want to have a youth cabinet. I want to have young people from every state in the country who are sharing ideas with the president. I'm going to have common ground dinners in the White House, not the black tie affairs for celebrities and heads of state, which we'll do too. But every month I'm going to have a dinner with just average, everyday, normal Americans from all around the country to sit casually with their president and, and have dinner. We're going to do it differently. In the Congress, no, the filibuster is a total construct of Democrats and Republicans making their own rules. It's not constitutional. It's not, it's not something that we have to do. We are a majority country, right? The majority should rule, but the minority should have rights, right, when it comes to politics. Mm-hmm. And no, I don't. I think the filibuster should be eliminated. And I think we should have term limits. I think we need term limits in the Supreme Court for members of Congress. We have too many people who are just there to stick around. And they, and by the way, if you're all you're doing is protecting your position, of course you're not going to be helping many people mm-hmm. because if you do, you're taking risks. And nobody wants to take risks in Washington. And that's a big part of the problem. It's a really broken system. What would you say to people who say you're running a pointless campaign? Huh. <laughs> I just wish those people could come along with me for just one day and hear the stories and meet the people um, and see what I'm seeing, you know, because if this is pointless, boy, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm aghast, you know, because this is the most beautiful experience I've ever had in my life. It's, it's the most exciting, joyful, the most heartbreaking, the most inspiring, you know, the most soul searching, you know. And um, if you think this is pointless or you think I'm a buffoon or a fool or don't have a chance, hey, you know, uh, this is a nation of long shots. And I don't care where you come from in this country. uh, Anybody can do it. And if I can just if I can inspire one person to give something a shot or to take that jump or Mm -hmm. do the unthinkable, stand up and have a little bit of courage. I didn't think this would be me. You know, five years ago, I thought I'd be running my coffee shops, you know, being a dad and Mm -hmm. thinking about where I wanted to spend my last chapter. Right. And here I am. And I don't know why we're put in these positions, but if you don't seize the moment, shame on you. And I don't see anybody seizing the moment. And that's why if you call it pointless, say hey, more power to you. But I'm going to keep on keeping on. You did an event in New Hampshire. At, uh, one, they said not one person showed up. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. You know, like I, not one here, person. It, no, literally. Well, here, here's the funny. This is I'm so <laughs> glad you bring that up because Twitter, you know, we have we so we have all we have about probably six or seven young reporters that follow me around mm-hmm. and in the cold and and they bring their cameras and it's a tough job, right? Mm-hmm. And we, I was speaking at a college convention at a hotel in Manchester, New Hampshire. So I have a 1960 International Harvester Metro van. We call it the government repair truck. And that's what I drive around and I serve coffee. This is my way to get people to come up and say hi. And we simply brought some coffee outside. We parked the truck in front of the hotel because we thought these kids were gonna come on bus. When I say kids, college students were gonna come on buses and I thought it'd be nice to give them a cup of coffee right in the morning. Well, little did we know that the buses or cars parked in the garage and they came in through another entrance. So I was just sitting out there alone. But these reporters know that if they can make me look, you know, like lonely or sad or like, you know, nobody's showing up, that that's their viral opportunity. So a guy posts it, gets like four million views on that post. And then an hour later, he posted a picture of me playing bingo at a retirement center. I saw that picture. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. That got about 4,000 views. The one of me sitting in my coffee truck, you know, with nobody coming up to it, got 4 million views. What does that say? Think about it. What does that say? We are rewarding snark. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not rewarding sweet. We're not rewarding sweet. So, yeah, nobody showed up. And you know what? That happens a lot. Mm-hmm. Happens a lot. So be it. Some days you got hundreds of people. Some days nobody shows up. Mm-hmm. You got to keep going, man. You know, you got to keep going. And um, anyway, but that's how that stuff kind of works. Do you think debates when between candidates when Biden or Trump isn't there, or you think those are pointless? Because, you know, you and Marianne Williamson debated in New Hampshire on mm-hmm. Monday. Nikki and Ron DeSantis debated yesterday. But it's like, why are y'all going at each other? Like, the big fish aren't mm-hmm. even here. Well, hey, you got you to gotta do something. Mm-hmm. I mean, they want us to not debate. They want us to just go away. You know, I say, let's run to the fire. Let's stop mm-hmm. it. Let, let's not turn it over to them because they are the ones that are doing an injustice. Joe Biden is not serving democracy by doing this. Donald Trump, certainly not serving democracy. Mm-hmm. I really give credit to people who are willing to get on that stage when you only got five. Look, I, I think I'm at like two or three percent in the polls. No one knows. I, the best thing about not being known is two thirds of the country doesn't hate me yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So I'm out there pounding the pavement. If Marianne Williamson and I didn't do this, there would not be anything on TV about Democrats at all right now. 
we'd be handing it over only to the GOP every single night doing their debates. Uh, I wish these guys were debating even just once. Mm-hmm. How is it even reasonable that they can't? So I, I don't have an answer for you, Charlemagne. I think it's ridiculous, but I'm, we're going to keep debating. We do it in a very friendly way because we are respectful mm-hmm. people with dignity, want to call attention to the issues. And if we can, uh, we're going to keep doing it. And, uh, and if people start showing up, that's great. Is Biden's name even on these debates? Because I, I read in Michigan they're doing a Democratic primary debate. And if I thought I read correctly, I thought it said you, President Biden, and Marianne Williams. Well, I haven't read that. Maybe, yeah, I'm, if, maybe I'm tripping. I, 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 thought I hope, like boy, I hope so, because I think he has a res- If There was an article yesterday in the Washington Post that said that Joe Biden is gathering small groups of his wealthy donors in the White House um, to give them confidence in his abilities because they're worried. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, well, if he's doing that privately in the White House, why not show up and debate? Why not show the country the same thing, mm-hmm. right? If, if you've got it and you're ready to go, come up and debate, right? Answer questions, hold press conferences. He won't do any of those things. I did not, I don't think he's debating. Yeah, so. maybe this is old. It's a secretary of- Maybe from 2020. Jo- 2023, Secretary Jocelyn Benson released the 2024 presidential primary candidate list as required by Michigan law. And it says for the Democratic Party, it was you, Joe Biden, and Oh, Marianne that's Winston. just the people that'll be on the ballot. Got that's you, not got the debate. You, got you, got you. Okay. No, he should debate, guys. He should debate mm-hmm. just at least once, for goodness sakes. I don't understand any of this nonsense. But, you know, you don't... Look, I've been in this business only for six years. I know the game. Mm-hmm. You, know? you don't want... The only reason you don't debate is because you don't want to give platform to your opponent. And you're worried. You know, if you're strong, you're confident, mm-hmm. you know... Why wouldn't you debate? The only times you don't do it is if you are not confident. Joe Biden and Donald Trump are not confident men right now, let me assure you. Uh, That's the only reason they're not showing up, because they know if they got on that stage, uh, it wouldn't be easy for them. What happens to America if Biden loses to Trump? No hyperbole, Mm -hmm. no exaggeration. What do you think happens to America if Biden loses to Trump? Look, we've become so used to this notion that democracy is at risk. Well, let me tell you. I was in the House chamber on January 6th. You know, mm-hmm. I watched that speech that Trump inspired the insurrection. Call it whatever, call it whatever the heck you want. Mm-hmm. A riot, an insurrection, mm-hmm. a mob. I was there, and I was in the White House with Trump. I sat across the table with him. Uh, here's, the, here's what's going to happen. In his first term, he was able to attract some people of integrity. And I say that having worked with some of them. I passed a bill that he signed into law. Uh, he had staff that I really respect. In fact, I respect more to this day because I know that they torpedoed their careers by serving our country and serving in that administration. Turn up the clock to now. The man is on a revenge tour. That's right. The man will not be able to attract anybody of integrity. Mark my words. And he is on a mission to literally destroy every single institution of democracy. How do you destroy institutions of democracy? You depopulate them. Everybody of integrity, of competency, who's serving right now our government, by the way, they work really hard and they make very little money and it's not an easy job, we're going to lose a lot of them. And when you lose them, they're either going to be replaced with people who are sycophants of Donald Trump or uh, with people who are incompetent. And as he will methodically destroy these institutions, we will no longer have that foundation. Mark my words. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what's at risk. And he's, by the way, not just at risk, he's going to win. If it's Joe Biden at the top of the ticket, the whole reason I'm trying to issue this wake-up call to Democrats who are being deluded by the Democratic Party is he is going to lose. Young people in America now favor Donald Trump. Hispanic Americans, Latino Americans favor Donald Trump. 83% of Democrats under 30 want a different nominee. The Iowa, the Iowa youth poll came out yesterday. Donald Trump got the most votes of anybody, followed by Marianne Williamson and me. Joe Biden came in fourth place in amongst Iowa youth. Think, think about that, the sitting president of the United States. He is in deep trouble. He's losing in all the battleground states. His approval numbers are the lowest in, I think, American history. Mm-hmm. You know what, And you know what's going on in the black community? Mm-hmm. I mean, why don't we wake up? Why wouldn't we have a competition? Why wouldn't the Democratic Party want to have a competition? It's very weird. Yeah. Well, why? It's very simple. When you are connected to power and privilege and prestige, you want to protect it. And anything that might disrupt it is a threat. Mm -hmm. It's not about people. It's about the protection of privilege. Speaking of people, you talked about Trump destroying institutions. How do those institutions being destroyed impact us as as American citizens? Yeah, you know, I think they're, well, I think half the country right now feels 
that if we destroy these institutions, maybe it's a good thing. Yeah. It, right? No, absolutely. And I have to tell you, you know, I have great animus towards Donald Trump. Uh, I do not have animus towards people who support him because I think they're, I understand their anger. Democrats have completely, completely turned away from rural Americans. I think the promise to black Americans has never been fulfilled. I understand why people are angry and pissed off. Mm -hmm. I work with the very people who are so much more focused on just sticking around than sticking it to a system that isn't working, right? So that's a really provocative question. I think that's what's going on right now, Charlemagne, is that uh, there's a belief in this country that maybe it is time to tear everything down mm -hmm. rather than reimagine it, maybe reinvent it, maybe replace some of it. I'd like to spread out, by the way. I think the federal government should be located all around this country. Mm -hmm. I think we should have maybe the Ag Department somewhere in Kansas, right? Maybe the Commerce Department out in California, right? Bring bring something up to New York. Let's, let's spread it out, right? Um, but I don't think tearing it down is the answer. Uh, democracy is fragile and it only works if people participate. And I think we're in an era now where the lack of participation, both voters, candidates, public servants, mm -hmm. is going to be really, really challenging. And uh, I'm really worried. But I think your question is one that we should all be thinking about. Yeah, because whenever we have these discussions, we always talk about, you know, what these issues will do as far as the election is concerned. This yep. is going to cause this person to lose or that person to yep. lose. Or if this person gets in, they'll tear down institutions. Well, what does that yep. mean for us, the people? Because mm -hmm. like you said, there's people like that. It's like, tear it down. Yep. I don't I don't like the FBI anyway, or I don't like, yep. you know, I don't like the IRS anyway. You I got to tell you that you, you just, you, you really provoked me because um, it's another reason I'm doing this. I, if it, I feel this is one of our last chances to really demonstrate that we can do this. And it's going to take a very different approach. It can't be one party or the other, just 50% of the country trying to get it done. If we really don't find some way to work together, uh, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln had his team of rivals. You know, mm -hmm. he literally invited his arch rivals to sit at the table with him. The most brilliant move in American leadership, I think, literally, maybe in human history, to invite your biggest adversaries to sit at your table. That's exactly what we need right now. Because if you don't see yourself represented in that White House, when I say everybody should see themselves represented in that White House, we're going to fail. And here's the other thing about Trump. He's watched President Xi, he's watched Vladimir Putin basically become presidents for life. You don't think, you don't think come 2028, he's going to say, you know what? I think I'm going to stick around another four years. I've been saying that of course, for years. Of course, mm -hmm. of course. That's what's going to happen. And um, you talk about the end of democracy. What better represents the end of democracy than someone who says, uh, I'm going to forego the basics of American democracy. Mm -hmm. what, what what could the Biden administration do to energize people in reverse what we've seen we've been seeing in the polls, if anything? And when I say administration, I mean him and the vice president. Well, if they even can. I, Envy, I think you just hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. I, I've been in I've been in the consumer products business pr pretty much my whole life, and mm -hmm. marketing and packaging, right? You know, I, I know when a product you give it, it's it's kind of reached the end of its kind of life cycle when people have kind of moved on. People have moved on. Wow. And by the way. The truth is this, people have moved on from both these guys. Yes, absolutely. They're, they're really, yes. you know, my sense of listening to people is that people are really ready to turn the page. It's not just age. It's not It's not just these two specific men. It's really like a, there's this yearning to like, let's let's do something new, right? Let's get back to it. You know, I let's feel excited again and that things might be possible. Everything is so heavy. It's heavy for everybody. And um, that to me is the great opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, Let, let's, let's use this. My, I had a grandmother that used to say, and my father too, Dean, you got to turn chicken shit into chicken salad. <laughs> and I think this is the chicken shit that we got to turn into chicken salad. And um, I don't think there's anything Joe Biden can do to change this, to be honest with you. I think it is fully baked. We live in an era where once, mm -hmm. once your brand is hardened, it's really hard to change. He might say, well, we've got $90 million and... You know, at the end of the day, people are going to see it's democracy versus, you know, authoritarianism. How, how tired is everybody of just trying to vote for the lesser of two evils? You Man. know, how cool did they maybe get excited again about, Man. good you mm -hmm. know, some good stuff? And um, that's my hope. But boy, you guys, when only like 15% of Americans turn out and vote in primary elections, mm -hmm. how, we don't have the right then to get upset in a general election. So I hope everyone listening right now, if you really want to, if, if you want to give this one more try... Go out and vote in the primary and shake it up mm -hmm. because the parties don't want you to vote in the primary. They want to coronate these guys, but you still have the power. And this literally might be the last time you can literally use your vote and be powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's true. You know, it's just 
true. So please vote and let us try to change this nonsense. How do people donate to your campaign? Dean24.com. Okay. And uh, I don't consider it a donation. I consider it an investment. You know, I talked about ownership. I want you to own a part of this campaign. You know, I don't want just your money. I want your ideas. I want your time. I want your energy. I want your your commitment. Uh, I don't care. I don't care your race, your religion, your your geography, your politics. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I love everybody, man. And I'm really concerned about parties that are trying to tell us otherwise. I'm mm-hmm. tired of angertainment mm-hmm. telling us that we're more divided than we really are. So dean24.com, if you got five bucks, 10 bucks, that's awesome. But more than that, help me spread the word, you know, post something on social media, you know, get people to kind of mobilize and share your ideas. You know, I don't know it all. I got a lot to learn. Question, last question. Did you ever go to your, your uh, Miss Abby for advice? Oh, <laughs> yes, I went. No, well, I'll t- this is going to surprise you. Mm-hmm. She came to me and my brother more for advice because wow. she was really, when, when she died, I got her old school Rolodex, mm-hmm. you know. And what was so interesting about her, she would answer every letter. Her team would answer every letter that was sent in. And she didn't have, this is me too. I don't know all the answers. But when I don't know an answer, I go to someone who does, right? And she did the same thing. She had a Rolodex for every single topic you could imagine. Mm, Wow. And when she got letters from high school kids, particularly, she would send them to my brother and me to get a sense of stuff. You know, what's going on in high school in 1983, right? Yeah. So her advice was, you know, when you don't know the answer, Find someone who does. Wow. I wonder if a columnist could ever be that famous again. Like I literally yeah, just Abby. know Dear Abby from the newspaper. Yeah, like, you just know Dear Abby. Because yeah. that, well, that was the only, the newspaper. Yeah, was, totally. if, Matt, you know, you grew up somewhere and you didn't have anyone to talk to. You didn't have anyone to go to. They were the people you wrote because you'd get an answer from them. Yeah, Abby, and that was right. in the analog era. You know, I don't, to answer your question, I don't think we're going to have a columnist like that mm-hmm. anytime. Well, anymore. even a blogger, like even somebody yeah. just doing that online, I don't know if that could... You know, look at Dear Abby. You know, I would argue that Google is now Dear Abby. Yeah, there's a million yeah, Dear Abby's right. now. You that's got a problem, you Google it, it right? Yeah. right? Instead of you go to... And by the way, that's, I think, there's a book called uh, Future Shock written by Alvin Toffler in 1970. He said that technology is going to go so fast that humans will never be able to catch up. That's right. And in a way, the fact that Google has replaced Dear Abby is part of our big problem. People are going to screens instead of going to each other. That's you know, right. Let's come back to each other. All right. Well, there you have it. It's Dean, Dean Phillips, Phillips, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and it was uh, Give It To You. Give It To Me. Give Me That Funk. That, 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 that. Jay-Z, I Want To Love You. Gotcha. Featuring I Want To Love You. I Want To Love You. Hey, that's a, good, that's a good way to end this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there it goes right here. It's Dean Phillips, ladies and gentlemen. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Thank you. Wake that ass up. Early in the morning. The Breakfast Club.